everyone. Welcome to Inside Steam Hungary, guys. My name is Michelle Cornwall Jordan, and I am your host. I'm very, very excited because this is a new web chat video. I, I'm so excited about this. And I'm, I'm very happy to have as my first guest um, uh, the wonderful author Jeffrey Cook and Catherine Perkins. They're here to chat with me tonight, and I am so excited. Welcome. How are you guys? Doing good. Thank you for having us. Thank you. I'm excited that you're here. Well, what we're going to do for those that are out there um, listening, could you please go ahead and tell a little bit about yourself? Um, how about we do ladies first? <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Um, Catherine Perkins. I live in Mobile, Alabama currently. And um, I uh, was um, the editor, series editor of the Dawn of Steam trilogy of um, epistolary steampunk novels and um, I have done a bunch of short stories with Jeff and um, so oh gee sorry <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, um, we also write in other genres as well but those are our main steampunk works the dawn of steam setting uh, which has three uh, books in the trilogy and which we may revisit in a year or two um, to continue the story later on. It's very history heavy and so that's why um, I think I was particularly helpful as an editor since I had a master's degree in um, history with a honors thesis in uh, British 19th century British imperialism so it was wow. pretty useful for fact checking and, and that sort of thing. And. Um, very, very, very cool. And Jeffrey? So I'm Jeffrey Cook. I am the author of uh, seven novels now, um, sometimes with uh, co-writers like uh, the wonderful Kate Perkins, um, as well as a couple of novellas for the uh, Writer Punk uh, charity project, which includes some steampunk as well, but Kate was my co-writer on those. Um, I was the original author on the Dawn of Steam series uh, with a some help um, from one other author doing part of the framing narrative and footnotes and then got Catherine involved as the series editor and then she started voicing a couple of the characters. So really kind of got more and more involved with that and by the end of it we were starting up the writer punk project and asked her to co-write a steampunk version of Shakespeare's The Witcher's Tale. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's really where we kind of launched into uh, co-writing, and we've done um, a uh, couple of young adult uh, fantasy novels now together. But Dawn of Steam, and then the novellas in the Writer Punk Project, and a series of uh, also fairly history-heavy, uh, steam more traditional Victorian steampunk short stories. That are in a few anthologies are our main uh, steampunk works. Very, very cool. Well, what I would love to do is I want to get into um, a little bit more about what steampunk is. Sure. Um, so, Jeffrey, you're like the first, the first father of steampunk. So, for, for our viewer, viewers, what is steampunk? Okay, so. Steampunk at its core is 1800 science fiction. Uh, some people will prefer to say Victorian, but given that most of the inventions that really um, typify steampunk and the general feel and use of steam power extended long before that, it really can get into the Regency, into Edwardian. Um, it has a lot of influence from clockwork, which goes back in some cases to the 5th century BC. So there's influences and you can do steampunk um, well before that. So my the Dawn of Steam series is all actually Regency and very much about setting the foundations of more traditional Victorian steampunk settings in a lot of ways and setting up a lot of the tropes. Now, most steampunk does have to involve steam power as a major influencer on the world and the passive technology not taken that some some of what where the punk comes into it is things that didn't happen alternate history 
and the general aesthetic and look to it. You know, it was very much influenced both by steam power, but also by the photographs we have from the time, because the actual era tended to be very, very colorful and look a lot different. But because we have all those sepia tone photos, mm -hmm. the browns and tans and general look has very much informed our aesthetic. Really? So, yeah, steampunk cool. actually looks very little like the real Victorian. Wow, okay. Very, very cool. I'm learning, I'm learning things, guys. I love talking to, to Jeffrey because I learned so much. Um, okay, well, let's start with this. How did you find steampunk? Because this is, that's what we're focusing on um, mm -hmm. as steampunk authors. How did you find it? How did you get on that path? Well, okay. I am. Well, um, go ahead. Please. I uh, had admittedly already been into, interested in several steampunk comics and, uh, you know, that sort of thing, as well as just liking uh, the original uh, 19th century science fiction written by Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and that sort of thing. So personally, it's pretty easy for me, but what is pretty funny is how Jeff decided to write Dawn of Steam. Can I tell it? <laughs> Yes, yes. You tell the story much <laughs> better. This situation where he has this tendency to just sort of wake up with a character idea, right? Right. And in this particular case, he wakes up with two characters. His problem <laughs> is this one person over here, she belongs in a Western, whereas this other person belongs in some kind of fancy science fiction. <laughs> and thus, together, how could they be in the same story? And fortunately, steampunk. So it's an alternate yeah. history. So you have this fancy sci-fi battle suit, but it's in the 19th century. So it can be this steam powered battle suit alongside this person who belongs in a Western and they have the whole adventure and that sort of thing. <laughs> and, um, he then waited, you know, did a bunch of research until NaNoWriMo came around and then did uh, the National Novel Writing Month where most people are trying just to write 50,000 words. Yes. But had to hit 50,000 words around day four, and by day 26, he had 300,000 three, oh word, three volume epistolary novel. That's or insane. rather, novel. Because it was either going to be a trilogy or the steampunk war and peace. <laughs> but anyway, I found it really interesting that it was the idea of he had the characters, and what's the world that they could possibly live in together? Steampunk. So he went with steampunk. And wow. Very cool. Jeffrey, how did you find Steampunk? Well, Dawn of Steam really was where I first really dove in hard to it. I mean, before that, Steampunk is very, very big here in the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. I mean, Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver, BC all have their own Steampunk-centric conventions, all of which draw between 500 and 2,000 people each. Yeah. So it is, it is a very big thing out here and kind of has been since I think it was 2006, mm -hmm. we had a group of artists brought a working steam engine to Burning Man down in Nevada uh, from this region, and that really started the explosion of the, the visuals and visual interest in steampunk mm -hmm. spreading out. I mean, steampunk has been around um, since the, the 1960s, 1970s, really, okay. in literature, proliferated in the 70s, and I've... You know, certainly read some um, Jeter, Blaylock, Powers, um, Gibson and Sterling's The Difference Engine is one of my uh, favorite books. So literary, but it didn't really stand out from being a fan of a lot of other books. I just happened to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. uh, but a couple of friends of mine were very big into steampunk, one of whom makes her own full Victorian dresses <laughs> and things like that for dress up. Mm -hmm. So started kind of pushing me in that direction. So when I had the ideas for the couple of characters from Dawn of Steam, it wasn't that hard to start exploring the steampunk and then just started doing the research on the history aspect very, to it. Very cool. Wow. 300,000 words. That's insane to me. Well, tell us a little bit more in depth about the books, Dawn of Steam. Um, Catherine, did you want to feel that or... I'd be happy to. Um, spoilers. <laughs> well, Jeff's big strength as a writer is the sheer output that he can yes. do, particularly when he turns off that part of his brain that understands the difference between it's and it's, or how to use a comma, or anything like that. <laughs> you know, not to be, you know, ragging on him. He's like, yes. 
<laughs> yep. yep, she's it's, right. Um, it was it was a, you know a very massive story in need of an editor. <laughs> what I really uh, find interesting about it, he mentioned earlier, right, that it's mm -hmm. set during the Regency, uh -huh. but because of what we would call the Regency period, the time where Jane Austen is set and all of that stuff, the time um, of the Napoleonic Wars, etc. But in this, this is alternate history, so they wouldn't consider themselves in a regency at all because there's no legal regency in the British Empire during this time because George III met with an unfortunate airship accident. <laughs> and so there's no legal regency at all. It's just the reign of George IV to them. Okay. The style that the letters are written in is what we would call the regency style because it's epistolary. It's all told through letters, journal entries, the occasional newspaper article. Um, I will admit, on the in the third volume, there is one page that is simply a, uh, a note that was written on a napkin. So uh, technically not all letters and journal entries, but all letters, notes, it's all supposed to be sort of the primary sources that the person in the framing narrative is sifting through and footnoting and that sort of stuff mm -hmm. and trying to show how this timeline evolved from 1815 into what most people would consider normal Victorian steampunk. Right. And, uh, so it's really interesting to have it all together as this, and it, <coughs> I'm sorry. Yes, okay. So the framing narrative is that the narrator's widow is sifting through his personal papers and trying to publish them as a way of telling his story of his adventure around the world after the Napoleonic Wars. And Jeff can elaborate a little more if, if you'd like. Sure. Sure. So, um... I've always had an interest in history and mythology and things like that. And I wanted to play a little bit with that. This is typically much more Kate's period of history than mine. Uh, my interests tend to go further back, although I really got to explore some of my favorite stuff in book two of the series with getting into the Maori potato wars in uh, New Zealand. Cool. Um, but I also, as part of the book, in addition to just wanting to tell an adventure story and play with history and make some of these very real events a part of the narrative, I wanted to take a look at the foundations of steampunk and say, okay, how could we get from something sort of akin to the real world with a little bit of science fiction, but the politics and social roles and a lot of that are fairly familiar to a historian, to the Victorian steampunk with, you know, steam very much being an influence on all of technology and the airships go everywhere and cool. more egalitarian yeah. social roles. So you have the, you know, mad scientists with, you know, fancy gears and goggles and you have the women as airship captains and doctors and the, the, the you know, <laughs> girl in a fancy dress and a giant wrench that are such, you know, poor images to Victorian steampunk mm -hmm. that are very much not a familiar thing to the real Victorian. <coughs> so I kind of, part of the reason for going, Regency was going further back from that, starting with something kind of real world familiar mm -hmm. and then trying to start out having these, you know, female characters who were in one way or another very ahead of their time and influencing <coughs> having the exploration of the world, having, you know, degrees of mad science and airships and, you know, the <laughs> whole train battle suit is a one of a kind invention. Mm -hmm. Very important to the shaping of the narrative and the changing of the world. And when we do revisit the world, because we already have titles for books four and six. Insane. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and first and, you know, first and last letters for the, the fourth book. Um, so we know it will happen. It's just a matter of getting through our current engagements, finish that, um, catch our breath a little bit, recover uh, some sanity <laughs> before we get to it, but it will happen. Um, and then we... No, go ahead. And then we get to delve more into how, not only how did the timeline uh, divert in the first place, but how does it divert even more from the events of the first trilogy? Right. Uh, due to the events of the first trilogy, how does it divert even more from um, history as we know it? And yes. because especially since we've seen 
you see the narrator have a kind of personal uh, realization throughout the series where he's very much a man of his time, mm -hmm. mouthing your standard male British imperialist party line kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then over the series, he's encountering new cultures, new things, new experiences with the female characters, et cetera. And there's this gradual sort of, oh, you know, <laughs> as he learns more and that sort of thing. And the idea is that this technology and this stuff will also shape the culture sociologically as well as our heroes' opinions, you know? That's fascinating. It really does. Um, and I, I want to go more into it, but I'm, our time, really, believe it or not, is going down. So I want to talk about the new work as well. You had a new sure. release, Street Fair. Can you yes. tell us about it, please? Okay, so we have, yeah, we have a brand new release. We just put out Street Fair on January 1st, which is book two in our Fair Folk Chronicles, and that's getting really much more into my history and expertise <laughs> with mythology, and I wanted to do a set of stories that very much involved old school Celtic mythology and fairy tales. How cool! Um, so we went into it even before I knew the story. I knew it was going to be four books, because going way back into Celtic mythology, I wanted to involve the four legendary treasures of Ireland, the four lost cities of the Fae and the four big seasonal events of the old Celtic calendar, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, the, the Fae of England, Scotland, Ireland. And then just because it's the, the book is interacting with this, but set in modern Seattle, I threw in the Hawaiian mythology and the Menahune as well. <laughs> and as the series goes, it'll get a little bit more into world fairy tales and mythology. Wow. You guys are all, how long does it take you, you both, whether together, I suppose, to do your parts, to write a book. I mean, do you alternate? Does well, Jeffrey write Well, it? took one month for the roughest draft and then years to edit. Really rough. Wow. wow. Years? Yes. So I, he, um, he didn't get, we didn't get to that point in our friendship where he's willing to say, hey, will you look at my manuscripts until a couple of years after he'd uh, actually written the rough draft. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> See, where, where Kate was very, very truthful in saying, my strength is putting a lot of words on the page very quickly when I get going. Mm -hmm. Long form writing, you know, is the strength. The, the, I like the research parts of it. I'm a god awful editor. <laughs> I know that I need an editor. I know that I need a good one. I was very, very lucky to find Kate, and she is really what makes a lot of this work mm -hmm. and really puts the ideas together. She is brilliant with some of the dialogue and clever turns of phrase. And ideas that, you know, will turn books around midstream. Um, and I love that feedback and the kicking back and forth and the collaborative writing process. How cool. So, well, with what Don of Steam, it took me a long time once he finally was willing to show it to me. <laughs> to clean up what he, um, what he managed to produce super fast with our more uh, fully collaborative works. Mm -hmm. We have a kind of process. Mm -hmm. We talk yeah. out the outline together. And then I will go through and write bits. Because I, that's the thing, I'm really great at ed uh, editing and rewrites. But when it comes to generating output myself, I'm more of a one paragraph at a time kind of girl. And so mm -hmm. I will put in a paragraph here, a paragraph there, a paragraph here, totally non-sequentially with dialogue and character moments and stuff like that. Then Jeff goes through and fills in the in-between parts with action and plot points and action and plot points. Wow. And just stitches it all together. And then I will go through that and take off all the rough edges because he'll contradict himself. Yes. Or forget what we agreed on regarding this. <laughs> That's the thing. So I go and smooth it all out. And then we have our draft um, after several passes between the two of us. You know? How long does it take for you? With the, the uh, it whole... takes about two months. Okay. Two so, three months. Yeah. So it was pretty good time. For and then there's things like beta about... readers and stuff like that, obviously. Right. Um, wow. Well, in all of the books, which one, and this is like asking you to choose between your favorite child, and I'm sorry, but what is one of your favorite scenes? I'm going to ask first, um, Catherine, what is one of your favorite scenes out of any of the books and why? And then Jeffrey. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's a tough call. Um, of all of the books we've done, um, one of my favorite scenes is probably uh, one we haven't written yet in the draft that comes after Street Fair. <laughs> okay. Of the stuff that's published, 
Oh, gee. I, yeah, that's different. <laughs> well, it's, it's, yeah, book three is written, but we haven't, it's not beta read or published or anything yet. It's coming. Um, sorry, so that I just had to, I, my, my, my need for accuracy has to stipulate, yeah, my absolute uh, clarity probably book that isn't published yet. <laughs> um, our, one of the ones I'm most proud of in uh, our original trilogy together and stuff that I edited is um, quite possibly <laughs> um, <laughs> Did you want Sorry. me? To, that's okay. Sorry. Probably um, we, you want to think about it a little, and then we ask Jeffrey, and they come back. Or how did you want to do it? I was uh, okay. I will, you know, talk properly. In Dawn of Steam, oh, the first we did, yeah, one of my favorite scenes is there is a um, half Romani, half Italian fortune teller, right, mm -hmm. uh -huh. working in tarot cards. And the original draft, all Jeff had put in was. And she does stuff with tarot cards. She does stuff with tarot cards. What I really know is I actually, uh, I've researched tarot cards pretty in depth over the years personally um, as a cultural phenomenon. And um, so I was able to go in and have her actually do the readings, explain the cards, saying what cards she associated with How which cool. and which cards she associated with what they were dealing with and, you know, that sort of thing. Like, so, I mean, there's a uh, one character in the novels who um, the fortune teller sees her as the upside down fortitude card. And that, oh, I think, yeah. helps inform the impression of the girl in question. And, you know, that's the thing. And she sees another character as this, she sees another character as that. So it, um, I thought it was an interesting uh, way of both expanding the fortune teller's character and let her seem less flat, you know, mm -hmm. um, as, as she's doing, you know, these, as she's working her, her, uh, you know, her craft. And also in its way kind of informs everyone around her with how she sees them in this, this cultural conception. I also had to let him know that it was a good thing he made her half Italian because in 1815, <laughs> gypsies didn't use tarot cards. Yep. At the time, only Northern Italy used tarot cards in fortune telling. It later caught on with gypsies in the mid 19th century. You and are so awesome. Thing, good thing you made her half gypsy, like I mean, half, half gypsy, half Italian. Did you do that on purpose? And he's like, no comment as to whether I did that on purpose. <laughs> wow. I think that is so cool. Of all that knowledge you have as far as history, because I'm a history buff, but you are, I would love to just pick your brain. You're awesome. You rock. Thank you. <laughs> what do you know that? Very, very cool. And Jeff? And Jeff. Favorite scene. Okay. What? So, <clears throat> I think, as I said, for, you know, a big thing I really, really enjoyed getting to do the Maori potato wars in Gods of the Sun. And that covers a whole bunch of scenes, so I'm not going to go too much into it, but that was because you've got Asian steampunk, you have British steampunk, you've got American Wild West. It's something from that era and very real history and a critical turning point in cultural history there that doesn't get a lot of coverage. And, you know, with all of her knowledge, and, you know, Kate is definitely the expert on British imperialism <laughs> and Europe. And, you know, was not, it's a time period she was not aware of, but tribal I, culture's history yeah. is, you know, very important to me um, and something I wanted to do. So I really enjoyed getting to do that. But just for a single scene, I think one of my sheer favorites to write is the action of uh, Sam Bo in the uh, ballroom. Um, it's one of the ones that I do the most readings of from Dawn of Steam First Light with this character in the middle of an assassination attempt and assassins and chaos everywhere and people trying to get the French royalty and the, the territorial governors out of the room and people fighting. And here's this person fighting with, you know, place setting uh, silverware <laughs> and, you know, steak knives and, you know, the, the half Italian, half Romany character loans Sam her bodice knife so, you know, she's protecting people and fighting people with guns and, you know, surrounded and all this other stuff. But she's and got a borrowed bodice knife in one hand, a steak knife in the other, and she's in her under things. 
and because you can't find in a corset. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Totally okay, and get yeah, she's in her under things in part because first discovering that you know Regency dresses were not really ideal for fighting in. <laughs> So part of the fight, the half Italian, half Romany character is trying to saw through the strings on her bodice <laughs> so that Sam can actually fight. And once she does, you know, she's all over the place. Sam is one of my favorite characters to write just because she's so different. And she was also one of the starting characters. She's the throwback Western um, character who in the midst of all of this guns and high technology has a couple of knives and you know, is a frontiersman and explorer but also getting to the end of it and covering that, well, everybody else, okay, that was an assassins and that was a disaster and all sorts <laughs> of stuff. And Sam just, hey, that was fun. <laughs> Very cool. I like that. Oh, my God, that's cool. For your research, how, well, I know that a lot of it, you know, is Catherine in certain time periods. How do you do your research as far as the, you know, any other details? For your punks. Okay, so even even without Catherine, um, you know, because she wasn't involved in the process when I was first writing, she improved okay. it drastically. Mm -hmm. But first, I do a lot online, but I also do some from family histories. I read a lot of Verne, H.G. Wells, uh, Mary Shelley is my favorite author. Uh, Frankenstein is my favorite book. Uh, James Clavell's Shogun. Um, a lot of historical fiction and things from the time, both for the history, but also like reading Austin to get a feel for the words and the rhythm and the writing and trying to reproduce some of that feel as well as reading letters from the time from, you know, some of the, the founding fathers of the United States and preserved documents. Um, I so, actually can't remember, Jeff. Did you decide to set it in 1815 before you knew about the eruption of Tambor or after? I, I set it in 1815 because of the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Okay. I didn't know about Tambora yet. I went into it saying, okay, so 1815, what happened in 1815? Well, okay, so a supervolcano or near supervolcano eruption caused a volcanic winter that plunged the world into you know, famine and darkness. And it was called the year without a summer. Oh, and meanwhile, the biggest storm, you know, in recorded history to hit the American Northeast Coast happened. And I have characters in an airship. I have to use these things. <laughs> Those were not originally part of the narrative, but they really became part of it. Very, very cool. Now, okay, how? Because you said family history. Mm -hmm. uh, you used your family history as well. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Very cool. Very um, cool. <laughs> yes, yes, colorful history in the Northwest West region and all kinds of stuff. Plus, yeah. um, you know, he's also just as they're in general much more up on cultures and that sort of thing than I am, as we've mentioned earlier. And but that leads to fun things like my learning how to spell check Apsa Aluke. Which, you know, that is not something you can get a word document to do for you. Have to learn we got Japanese. Okay, I believe. Now I have a really big question for you because I've actually spoken with others that are dabbling or just coming into steampunk, and this is a big one for myself as well. How do you figure out the gadgets? How do you come up with the gadgets? The, but you, oh, you, can you, I say something on this one, Jeff? Yes. Yeah, yes, please. One thing, and Jeff actually has the lenses for this that um, someone ended up making for him, and it was it's wonderful. But Eddie in Dawn of Steam. Mm -hmm. You see, everyone in steampunk, you know, is used to there being stuff with goggles, right? Yeah. And one of the constant goggles things that you see a lot of are jeweler's goggles with right. the little lenses. But yeah. they usually just appear to be wearing them just to wear them because it looks really neat. Like me, right now. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, Eddie is wearing jeweler's goggles for a specific purpose. The goggles do something. He's a sniper, right? So this is before guns had scopes, and he's a sniper operating before then, so he uses the jeweler's goggles and sets the lenses just so, and he's you know, redesigned them to be a sniper's scope on the goggles. How cool. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, that's How one cool. of the great things about Eddie. His goggles do something. There's an actual, you can How see cool. what the 
function and the form and the aesthetic all fit together, you know? That's cool. Very cool. I like that. But um, any other gadgetry? I mean, how do you come up with other, you know, devices? I think that was one of the, uh, for the newcomers that are coming in and myself, we, we have no idea really how to create that. Do you well, Jeff's really uh, research, sorry, Jeff's oh, researched yeah. a lot of aeronautics history. And so he knows a lot more than I do about what the airships of the time were like and how they could have been, you know, different and that sort of thing and how things could have gone differently as they explored that possibility. Okay. Um, and, but the, the main, the big, mo besides the airship, the most primary gadget in Dawn of Steam is the Coltrane battle suit. Okay. which is, I like to call it the 1815 Iron Man armor. Mm -hmm. So a lot of steampunk, you see. <laughs> one thing I would suggest to you with trying to figure out the gadgets is yeah. think of a technology that we have. Now think that if we had gone further in steam power and gone towards that gadget with steam power, how would it have ended up? Like you know? in this, yeah. Or in this case, think of a technology that comic books have and how would we have gotten to that with steam power? power mm -hmm. because the Coltrane battle suit is this huge steam powered suit of armor that you know can do all of these things but it's running off of steam power love it you guys are geniuses <laughs> um, <laughs> and the the other part of the answer to that first I my father is a mechanical engineer oh <laughs> he first read the book and that is not that is not my strength at all when he first read the book his first comments back to me, you know, he was one of the beta readers and he made a few notes here and there, but his big thing was, well, I want to figure out how the airship works. <laughs> and, you know, hey, I could diagram this stuff for you. So I've at least been exposed to that general idea about curiosity about technology. And he's built an entire business largely on the idea of getting into a conversation, having somebody say, you know, I wish there was something out there that did this. Yes. And this is in complex medical fields. And going into his garage the next day and building a prototype of a machine that did that. That is incredible. Very um, cool. So, you know, I've gotten to see this process and see crafters and makers, which I am distinctly not. <laughs> um, but also just for steampunk, first of all, you've got a lot of inspiration from the real world. Mm -hmm you know, with steamships and steamboats and trains and balloons and the attempts at airships. Um, you've also got, you know, things like the analog computers. If you, again, one of my favorite books for people really interested in watching a master of the craft doing world building for steampunk, read The Difference Engine. Uh, because that really all started 1824, Babbage and Lovelace's uh, analytical engine. And how actually having had that work instead of fail, you know, could have changed the world as a direction to go. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, there, Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, mm -hmm. you know, read the things that inspired steampunk. Uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot out there that can really help inform it as well. But also just steampunk is great because there's a lot to interact with. There's musicians, there's crafters, there's inventors, there's, you know, whole cultures. And it, a lot of those people are online, you know, look at what the crafters are throwing together. Mm -hmm. Look at the ideas out there. Um, and, you know, in some cases, like with Eddie's goggles, I just knew with, you know, looking at going to a steampunk con and just seeing person after person after person with goggles sitting up on their hats. Mm -hmm. I, I had to do something with it, but I had, if I was going to do it, I had to make it functional. So I wanted to play with all these things that I was seeing, but those things were already there. I wasn't inventing anything new. I was just repurposing it and turning something that's largely a decorative element into, okay, how can I twist this around and make it work? Very nice. Very cool. Very cool. You guys are awesome. So I really am looking forward in the future to some type of, um, Steampunk how to coming from you both, <laughs> you know, help the rest of us, please. That's awesome. Um, well, to wrap it up, we do do need to head that way mm -hmm. just for fun. Um, do you do do you do the shows, the uh, the craft shows, the conventions? Do you um, do you have a name? Uh, do you have us? You know, have some have the alternate personalities? Do you go that far more into the cosplay? No. Yes. 
And also, I'm going to throw a third one out at you. Where do you see Steampunk going from here? Because it's become a little bit more, I'm not going to say mainstream, but it is going more mainstream. Do you think it's going to hang around for the next year or two or filter out? And in all of those questions. <laughs> We do do conventions, but that's uh, often in terms of uh, book sales and discussions of the literary history of steampunk okay. and um, that kind of thing. Uh, we don't do alternate personas. He's got a great costume. I've just got this uh, this one little dress with the steam uh, gear flowers. Um, <laughs> But we don't do alternate personas, but I think that part of it is because we get so, when we have a character, we end up writing it and including it in the sto the books or the short stories kind of thing more than uh, uh, doing it uh, for a convention. Mm -hmm. But um, So we do do a lot of those. And I, Jeff would probably have a better uh, point of view on this, but I think that since, you know, steampunk has, uh, you know, it took a while to sort of emerge as strongly out of the literary, you know, vein that it was, in the whole time of the internet, but I think that now that these communities are building up, it's going to continue to have a steady presence of some sort or another for quite some time. Very cool. Jeffrey? And yeah, what, as Kate said, you know, we do do, or she does some conventions uh, down where she's at and is starting to do more this year, which is awesome. <laughs> um, I will probably be doing about 30 conventions, events, fairs, et cetera, this year. Yes. Wow. Um, most of them working with uh, science fiction fantasy author Lee French up here. Um, we, together, the two of us are uh, part of an author's collective we're calling Clockwork Dragon, uh, combining my steampunk, her fantasy for the inspiration behind the name. Don't really have a persona, but we're certainly building kind of that business identity in science fiction fantasy books. Uh, my cosplay is kind of limited. I'm definitely there to draw attention, so I've got sort of the Sambo's hat with Eddie's goggles on them that a uh, local crafter made for me, um, which I absolutely love and unfortunately don't have because they're in Lee French's car after the last <laughs> week. We just did OrcaCon. We'll be meeting to do RustyCon this weekend. And the same person made him this really neat steampunk cane, which is great because with the whole steampunk outfit, his old cane, which he actually does need for mobility, wouldn't have worked. So it's very good to have a steampunk one. Yes, very Nathan cool. Nathan does really amazing work. But yeah, I, as far as, you know, steampunk has been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, it's definitely pervasive enough up here that every convention has a fairly decent sized steampunk presence, despite which I still get a whole lot of people coming up to me with the whole, what is steampunk? Or can you explain steampunk to me? My steampunk 101 panels that I do a lot of, at a lot of conventions are usually pretty packed. So I think there's still a lot of curiosity and a lot of people coming into it. You know, I don't necessarily think it's going to keep growing and growing at the rate it has been but I think it still probably has a couple years of growth in it, and then it's going to maintain a, at least a steady presence because it is a neat look, it is a culture, it is a feel, and is a neat part of science fiction. And science fiction and fantasy, once you get things to a certain level, they tend to stick around. I mean, you still have people coming to cons in Star Trek, Star Wars, all these yes. old classic series, all these fandoms that have been around forever. And I think steampunk's future is probably somewhere in that where it won't, you know, just keep growing exponentially, but it is going to have a steady presence. It's not going to go away. I believe, I believe that is true as well. Guys, thank you so much for joining me this evening. I just love chatting with you both. Now, um, can you please just let the audience know where they can connect with you and grab copies of your books? Okay, there's an authorjeffreycook.com and a clockworkdragon.net. Yep. And um, we have an official Facebook page, and uh, it's uh, d slash Dawn of Steam Trilogy, uh, facebook.com slash Dawn of Steam Trilogy. And all of our books are available on Amazon uh, in both print and ebook forms. All right. All right. Well, is there anything that you would like to say to new writers out there in the genre? Any well, word of advice? Go ahead, Kate. 
Okay, well, uh, in the genre, I think that um, a little research is always good. Know the rules of history so that you can break them. <laughs> and, um, one I like thing that. I just wanted to note as a very specialized thing, but on the issue of conventions and stuff, Clockwork Dragon is actually in the process of putting out a how-to guide to conventions for independent yes. authors. Very so cool. that should be out eventually. Well, about two forward. months. I will look for it myself. And, and so will you, and I, I said it earlier in passing, but I, I am serious. Do you guys think you will ever do a how to as far as writing steampunk or because there really is no resource out there. I mean, well, there's not a we hard get the time to properly compile all of our notes from these Jeff steampunk 101 panels and the other stuff we've learned. We really uh, might see about getting that onto paper after we've gotten like a few dozen other things off our plate. Unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, mo there. Most of the future is most of my future projects right now are science fiction and fantasy. Mm -hmm. The indie authors con guide was one of those things we weren't expecting to do it at all. But people kept telling us, you know, when watching us put uh, our tables at cons together and then work it, yeah, okay, you guys need to write a book on this. Somebody finally told us this and said if we didn't, she was going to. <laughs> and we both said, no, we don't have time. We have too many projects. Found out that night, well, in the midst of the, a convention, I'd been up until 3 a.m. scribbling down notes, and she woke up at 4.30 to scribble down notes. And we were talking about this on the car ride home and said, okay, we've got to do this. Definitely. Well, awesome. Um, so it's come together really quick and we've done it mostly as a conversation back and forth between the two of us on different points of conventions. But as far as advice to new writers or writers in general, mm -hmm. um, and since she's right here, I will say, you know, find a good editor that you can work with. Find somebody to bounce ideas off of. Because, you know, I will happily say it that, yes, I put a lot of words on the page, but Kate is really a yeah, absolutely critical part of the process and what makes it work. And I'm happy to, you know, now put her names on things and, you know, more even on the stuff where she's primarily the editor. That is such a huge part of making the books work and the fact checking and the bouncing ideas back and forth and expansion of characters and voice testing and all of the things she does, and that is really important to quality books out there, is having those ideas and expansion and doing the research and then getting the grammar correct and readable even <laughs> is really important in that, you know, so yes, editors can be expensive or hard to find, and sometimes it's just not the right person for you, but when you do find that right person, it can just turn the, the process into magic and is really, really important to produce professional caliber final work. Definitely. Well, guys, thank you so much for so joining much. me. I had a great time. Thank you. And I just hope that you will come back with the next projects and just let us know what is going on. And we just, I would love to continue to connect with you both. Anyway, thank Bye. you for joining me. <laughs> right. Thank you. And everyone that is out there, thank you so much for joining the very first um, kickoff of Inside Sting Punkery. And, you know, I'm hoping to bring to you each month um, great authors, uh, artisans, just entertainers bring you the world of steampunk. So look forward to that. All right, guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.